Good morning, Calvary. It's Friday and I get to share an encouraging word with you today out of Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3 is the, the passage that uh, verses 1 through 11 that I want to focus on this morning and, and just to encourage you because uh, the Apostle Paul actually starts this chapter out with a warning. He says, look, I don't mind uh, warning you about this again. Uh, and he warns them about people who want to tell them to trust in themselves. To trust in the flesh is the way he puts it, that, that they want to argue that you've got to be good enough, that you've got to be righteous in yourself, that you've got to earn somehow your salvation from God. And, uh, and he says you can't do that. He says it's impossible. And, and I know this is an important message for us because there's a lot of people through the years that I've talked to that are always saying, I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if I, if I can do this. I try really hard. I don't know if it's enough. And I always tell them assuringly, it's not enough. You can't be good enough. Um, there's no way it's possible to be good enough because we're sinners. But still, religion is always about trying to tell people, you got to be better. And, and here's the truth. Uh, God wants to save you by his grace and by his grace alone. And the Apostle Paul makes his point by saying, hey, don't trust in the flesh, because if anybody could trust in the flesh, Paul says, it's him. The Apostle says this, uh, he's describing his life. He says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a people of uh, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. The Apostle Paul is saying, look guys, I attained the status of the, the best of the best. I was a religious person, I was righteous, I was holy, I had a reputation, I was esteemed by other people. And he goes to say, that's not enough. You think you're good? He goes, I'm better than you. And here's what he goes on to say. He goes, none of it was worth anything. He says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. You know what he says? All that religious good works is trash. It's garbage. It's literally a heap of dung compared to the value of knowing Jesus. In Romans chapter 3, he says, My righteousness is like filthy rags before God because we're sinners. We can't save ourselves. We can't be good enough. We can't earn our salvation. We need Jesus because we're lost and hopeless apart from him. And so when we recognize that our goodness isn't good enough and we lay it aside, we give it up, we stop trying to look good in the eyes of people and we simply stand before God and we say, I need you. I'm hopeless without you. Save me. Our lives are transformed. And, and that's what Paul talks about in, in verse 10 uh, when he kind of summarizes his life's pursuit. In fact, I'd encourage you to let this be your life's pursuit as well. He says this in verse 10. He goes, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and, and sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. I want to know Christ. I want to share in his sufferings. I want to become like him in his death. Um, now, here's the thing. We want to know Jesus. We want to know the power of his resurrection. We're not so excited about sharing in his sufferings, and we don't really like the idea of, you know, being conformed or, or becoming like him in his death. So what does it mean? Well, Paul says, look, I, I want to know Jesus. That's my life's pursuit. More than anything else, I want to know the, the person who saved me. I want to have a relationship with Jesus. And I, I'm pretty sure that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you want to know Jesus better. And we really get excited about the power of the resurrection, right? Because we want the power over sin and death and hell. We want to experience that power of God in our lives that just defeats the darkness, that overcomes at all points. That's the power of the resurrection. Um, but here's the thing. You only get to the power of the resurrection by sharing in the sufferings of Jesus. Sharing in the sufferings of Jesus. That doesn't sound too exciting because that's pain, that's sorrow, that's loss, that's grief, that's hurt. Um, God meets us in our pain. He meets us in our sufferings. 
Uh, Jesus' brother, or half-brother James, uh, the apostle, said this, We consider it all joy, my brothers, when we encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of our faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you might be mature and complete, lacking nothing. God uses our sufferings to grow us up to be like Jesus so that we can know Jesus and the power of his resurrection, sharing in his sufferings, being conformed to his death or being made like him in his death. What does that mean? You know, in Jesus' death, that was the moment that he was perfectly obedient to the Father. He perfectly obeyed the will of God. And and that's what Jesus did. And if we're going to be like him in his death, that means that we sacrifice everything to be obedient to the will of God. That we lay aside our wants, our dreams, our hopes, and take hold of the mission of Christ. We take hold of the purpose, person of Christ and the purpose of Christ, and we let him be our lives. See, I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I don't really want to share in his sufferings, but I know it's necessary so that I might become like him in his death. That's my life pursuit. I pray it's your life's pursuit because you know the surpassing value of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord.